So hello everyone, uh, welcome to the TFR colloquium. I would like to introduce uh, Professor Fioralpa Sakoni from Rutgers University. Will be telling us about transmission eigenvalues and non-scattering in homogeneities. Uh, over to you, Professor. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to give this colloquium. Um, actually, it's like a miracle at uh, 6 a.m. here. I uh, find myself in, <laughs> at, at, in India, Mumbai. So I, um, uh, yeah, it, it's great. But on the other hand, uh, we miss, as we were talking, uh, personal interactions, professional interactions. Um, anyway, so I'm going to discuss here um, uh, two problems um, closely related. One is a non-self-adjoint spectral problem, and the other is a free boundary problem, uh, both uh, related to a fundamental questions in scattering theory. Okay, but uh, this, uh, let me just visually explain what a scattering uh, theory means. Uh, so scattering of waves uh, describes the interaction of waves with some background perturbation um, or a potential. In, in this case, there is this a background perturbation of compact support, which will be actually the case um, uh, of, of my discussion. Um, uh, so here uh, you, you see uh, like a plane, uh, plane wave probing this, this region. Once it hits this uh, perturbation of the background, it is disturbed. So then uh, in, the, in, uh, in the background now we have both um, the uh, field uh, caused by the uh, perturbation as well as the um, a probing wave. So in my discussion briefly, this is referred to as a total field. Um, and the scattered field is exactly what um, the interaction of this plane wave with the perturb background uh, with the perturbation uh, is. Okay, so scattering theory it's sort of an old discipline uh, which was central uh, in mid uh, 20th century. However, these days what is important um, is the imaging with waves, so inverse scattering. Um, and uh, basically, uh, from a picture like this, um, uh, which is, again is a, a scattered field, the interaction uh, due to this perturbation of the background, and not exactly from a picture like this, but uh, from a knowledge of the scattered field far away from the inhomogeneities, uh, you would like to uh, reconstruct the perturbation of the background. Okay, so this is inverse scattering. So I'm not going to talk about direct or inverse scattering, but to motivate my question, uh, it's natural to think that uh, it matters to imaging with waves, uh, whether there exists a scenario um, like, like the following. So, fi uh, 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 find a probing wave like say plane wave or any other physical wave that doesn't see at all the inhomogeneity say does 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 this scenario occurs in 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 in, in scattering theory so can you send an incident wave that doesn't produce any scattered field okay so this is important because um, it, uh, it, 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 it is related to um, unique determination of the inhomogeneities. Uh, it is related to cloaking and, and many more, okay? So this is uh, precisely the uh, question that I'm going to address in this talk, okay? So again, given an inhomogeneous medium, in my discussion will be of bounded support. You can extend it to potentials for Schrodinger equation. You can extend it uh, probably to non-compactly supported inhomogeneities, but in my discussion will be of compact support inhomogeneity. So given such an inhomogeneity, um, is there an incoming wave that doesn't scatter? So the, here is um, a, a sort of a, a visualization of one example uh, of, um, of an incident field, which is spherically symmetric, that doesn't see the, uh, an inhomogeneity that uh, you cannot see here, but it's a small small disk in the middle, okay? So there is no scattered field 
uh, outside, although there is scattered field, uh, if, uh, total field inside, okay? So can such a, a configuration occur in general? So before I develop this, uh, this question, I would like to throw out a couple of uh, uh, important books in uh, direct and inverse scattering. So for a uh, mathematical theory of scattering theory, Lux Phillips is like um, the main classical book in this, uh, in this uh, field. And uh, what I'm going to discuss uh, in relation to this question will be non-scattering wave numbers uh, and transmission eigenvalues. Um, however, for many, many years, uh, people have been studied uh, other um, eigenvalues, I would I'd put spectral parameters associated with scattering, and those are um, uh, the, the, the poles of the scattering operator, okay? So where you have some, uh, hum, I call it scattering parameter, uh, uh, spectral parameter, because it's related to some um, homogeneous uh, configuration of the PDEs um, uh, governing the wave propagation, right? Scattering uh, poles have been um, well-studied, very rich subject in scattering theory. So uh, to get really a good understanding of all, all these areas, uh, this book, uh, a recent book by De uh, Datelov and Suworski uh, discuss the mathematical theory of, um, of scattering resonances. So actually I'm going to make a case here that uh, now the new concept of um, non-scattering wave numbers related to transmission eigenvalues is as inherent, uh, inherent to scattering theory uh, as the um, uh, scattering poles. Okay, so now um, closer to what I'm going to discuss today uh, is a discussion of uh, um, direct and inverse scattering theory in acoustic electromagnetic um, by Colton Cress in this uh, in this monograph and. Uh, even closer to what I'm going to discuss now today is uh, uh, this uh, CBMS uh, science publication, where uh, which is more like a research monograph that uh, we we wrote uh, 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 in connection with transmission eigenvalues and how uh, they are used in uh, in imaging, so in inverse scatter. So, if there are students, graduate students in the audience, an introduction to this area. Uh, is this uh, AMS notice um, uh, uh, article we wrote a review on transmission eigenvalues that really introduce it at the, at the uh, in, uh, elementary level, the concept of transmission eigenvalues and non-scattering waves. Okay, so let me, let me proceed. Um, so um, one could consider all kinds of um, interrogation modalities, all kinds of uh, physics uh, of waves, uh, like could be acoustic, electromagnetic, elastic, one could consider nonlinear uh, medium and kind of develop the same question. However, I'm going to discuss this question in connection with uh, the simplest possible uh, scattering model, uh, acoustic, Homog in homo uh, uh, isotropic um, uh, wave speed um, uh, in R3, okay? So, and the idea that uh, I would like to um, discuss comes out very nicely and without any technicality of the forward model. So you see that the forward model, the model that I'm discussing this question, it's very simple, Helmholtz equation, okay? Which is the Fourier transformed uh, wave equation. Okay, so, so uh, let me introduce now some uh, terminology. Uh, this is the sketch of the scattering problem that I was, uh, I introduced at the beginning. And uh, I'm going to work uh, in, in frequency domain, uh, mainly uh, doing the Fourier transform of the wave equation. So there is a, a frequency parameter or Fourier parameter and uh, scaled with the sound the uh, speed of the background is the so-called wave number, which will play an important role because uh, this set of transmission eigenvalues and non-scattering wave numbers uh, are in terms of this, uh, this constant, which is a positive 
uh, positive constant in physics. So now the, the, the inhomogeneity is, is a perturbation of the background. The background is homogeneous. So therefore the sound speed uh, or the so-called refra refractive index is a function, okay? Um, in general, a bounded uh, function. And the support of n minus one is exactly the support of the perturbation, okay? One is a refractive index outside, okay? Um, so the incident field that you saw the plane wave in that uh, animation uh, in general uh, satisfies the Helmholtz equation, say in the entire space or could be like point sources, maybe uh, so in the you could have situation in the entire space except for a uh, zero measure manifold uh, away from the uh, scattering object. Okay, so this was the example of the plane away. So the total field uh, now satisfies this Helmholtz equation, but uh, inside D the refractive index is not one any longer but it's a, a function of x. And of course, physically, one has this uh, azomorphic radiation condition for the scattered field, right? So the little u is a scattered field that will be the main uh, function uh, in, in, in what, it, in what uh, comes next. Um, and a v is the incident field. The big U is the sum of the incident field and the scattered field, namely the total field. Okay, so now let me get um, uh, directly to, to my main, uh, main question. Um, so what does uh, mathematically uh, means uh, non-scattering wave number or non-scattering configuration? Okay, so to, uh, explain, uh, to explain this, let me uh, modify a little bit uh, uh, the equation. So if I subtract from U, I subtract uh, the incident field, then the equation for the scattered field becomes this one here, uh, becomes basically a uh, uh, source. Um, uh, a, a Helmholtz equation with a source and the source comes from the incident field. But remember the source on the right-hand side has compact support because one minus N is uh, different from zero only in the, uh, in the support of the perturbation, which I called D. Okay, so this is a scattered field. So very, it's a very simple equation. So now you say, well, uh, I would like the scattered field U to be zero outside. So to an observer, there is no interaction of the a probing wave within homogeneity, okay? So mathematically now, we must make sure to satisfy these three equations simultaneously. So the equation for the scattered field, it's a source problem, but the source uh, 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 here, it's in terms of a solution to Helmholtz equation in the space everywhere, but U must be a compactly supported uh, solution to this simple linear equation. So U must be zero outside D, okay? So of course, uh, this uh, uh, from simple, uh, PD um, theory, this is an over-determined uh, uh, set of equations, okay? So, but basically this is what we would like to see whether such a configuration exists. So does it, can we find a V uh, and a wave number, so uh, an incident field and wave number K uh, such that this, this holds, <clears throat> uh, has a solution U. Okay, so, so in order to make sure that we are not speaking on empty um, uh, ground, so I, uh, I'm simply uh, uh, looking at how about if we have a ball with a refractive index um, a function of the only radial uh, variable, so n of r, and see separate variables this is what we typically do when we try to understand uh, PDEs and see actually if such a situation occur. All right, so when you try to separate variables, it makes sense that you look at uh, solutions to the Helmholtz equation of this form. So I apologize for the dense um, uh, slides of formulas, but uh, uh, you don't have to pay attention to what these functions are. I'm just going to uh, emphasize uh, the, uh, their main role. Okay, so these are typically solutions to the um, Helmholtz equation um, uh, 
so basically of the background. So I take the incident field to be like this. Uh, uh, J's are uh, Bessel, Bessel functions. Um, and these are spherical harmonics. Uh, and you separate variables and you get a formula for the uh, scattered field outside, outside the disk, the, uh, um, uh, the inhomogeneity to disk. So this is basically the explicit formula for the scattered field. So now for the scattered field, there is a coefficient, which I'll discuss, which carries the, uh, all this information. And instead of Bessel functions, you get so-called Hankel functions, which are right Radiating solution to the to the Helmholtz equation, whereas Bessel functions are solutions, entire solutions to the Helmholtz equation. Okay, uh, only the radial part. Uh, but this is not important. What is important is this coefficient, and this coefficient here is given in terms of the de uh, these determinants. Okay, so. Um, uh, basically, it, it includes the uh, Bessel functions and the radial part of the uh, solution of the Helmholtz equation with uh, N of R. Basically, there are solutions to this ODE, okay? So all these functions are um, analytic um, uh, uh, functions uh, of K, okay? Um, so C and W uh, are analytic on K, actually entire functions of, 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 of K, okay? So now we have this coefficient and uh, where C becomes zero, then you have non-scattering wave numbers. Where W as a function of K for fixed and becomes zero, you have those celebrated scattering poles, right? So now the question is, uh, do this entire function uh, have zeros, right? So it turns out that uh, under some assumptions on N uh, to avoid this uh, trivial case when you have this entire function, so say C becoming identically zero, and this would be the average of N of R from a zero to one uh, is not zero, okay? That this this uh, entire function of K has infinitely many um, uh, real zeros, right? So there are infinitely many non-scattering wave numbers. And those non-scattering wave numbers correspond to incident field of this type, okay? <clears throat> so, and actually it's not trivial uh, uh, to kind of find out that actually there exist infinitely uh, many real zeros. Uh, but using the theory of uh, entire function and all kinds of behavior in complex analysis, you can uh, some asymptotic behavior for k large, you can you can um, arrive at uh, at such a result. Okay, so so basically this is what I said. Uh, it is. Um, uh, it is not, uh, for, for a ball, actually there are infinitely many non-scattering uh, wave numbers, so non-scattering configuration. So for any fix N of R, then uh, the, uh, you, you take this type of incident field and uh, one finds infinitely many uh, non-scattering wave number corresponding to this incident field. So now there are infinitely many incident fields, you can change the index of, uh, uh, this uh, Bessel function, so L uh, is uh, uh, runs through um, uh, all natural numbers, and you find uh, infinitely many configuration on non-scattering for uh, spherically symmetric media. Okay, so the incident field that uh, uh, are do not see a spherical uh, inhomogeneities are of this type known as Herlot's wave functions that are superposition of plane waves. So they are physical incident field, all right? Um, now, um, this, this configuration is uh, very sensitive to perturbations. So it's very kind of, uh, uh, related to the spherical symmetry of, uh, of the inhomogeneity. So recently, Michael Fogelius and uh, Xiao, they, they, they proved that uh, if for n constant, if you perturb a little bit this spherical configuration, then actually you can show that possibly at most uh, finitely many k 
uh, could be uh, non-scattering uh, wave numbers for any Herglotz wave function. So it's sort of uh, sensitive to perturbation, right? It's a, a spherical symmetric uh, configuration. So now I would make this connection uh, uh, now to uh, the transmission eigenvalue problem. Again, for spherical symmetric media, uh, you can see if K happens to be zero of this uh, uh, entire function, uh, what happens is uh, this uh, function V and this function W satisfy uh, this homogeneous problem. So V satisfies the Helmholtz equation uh, everywhere, in particular inside D, and W satisfies this uh, equation with a coefficient n, and they share the, so, the same Cauchy data on the boundary of the inhomogeneity. So this is a famous um, um, uh, transmission eigenvalue problem. Uh, so here, what I'm saying is that, uh, okay, um, if I call the values of K for which this homogeneous a spectral problem uh, uh, has a non-trivial solution, transmission eigenvalues. Here I'm saying the uh, following that all non-scattering wave numbers are transmission eigenvalues and every transmission eigenvalue is a non-scattering wave number for the, uh, for the spherical symmetric case, right? So now I have this question, non-scattering uh, 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 configuration for the scattering problem. And I introduced a spectral problem for the spherical symmetric case, but you'll see in general, it's a two elliptic equation inside the inhomogeneity uh, whose solutions say, share the same Cauchy data. So this is a spectral problem. Okay, so now for spherical symmetric media, these two questions are the same. Okay, so now I would like to um, uh, uh, discuss a little bit uh, this transmission eigenvalue problem for spherical symmetric media because I made this connection uh, they are the same thing if I um, uh, care only for uh, a physical wave numbers, right? But if I have to study this transmission eigenvalue problem, uh, so basically if I have to study all zeros of this entire function, it turns out that actually there are complex, uh, infinitely many complex zeros of the entire function. You actually can come up with a counting function, density and so on, everything that relates uh, to zeros of entire functions. So, so there are complex transmission eigenvalues also, but those are not non-scattering wave numbers because wave numbers are real in physics, right? So this, uh, this tells me that this eigenvalue problem is non-self-adjoint eigenvalue problem. So there is a lot of stuff for this uh, entire function, zeros and so on, and uh, related to scattering wave numbers in this book by Colton Kress, right? So now my question is, what happens in general, okay? So now it looks like I have this um, overdetermined set of equations for a non-scattering configuration, and it seems that I can come up with a related a spectral problem how now these uh, two um, are related in general and what happens, right? So I recall the uh, general non-scattering configuration, okay? Again, I have a compactly supported solution to this source problem where the source is, a is a supported in D uh, uh, and the source has this particular form Okay, where V is a solution to Helmholtz equation outside. So this was my non-scattering configuration. All right, so what would be the transmission eigenvalue problem related to this scattering configuration? Well, if I relax a little bit one of these overdetermined sort of uh, um, uh, conditions I have here. So if I say, uh, how about I worry about this uh, V to solve the Helmholtz equation only inside D, okay? So I, um, re I uh, restrict this equation only in D. So now I have a problem that it's formulated only in D and it's not over determined any longer. So I have this, solu this equation uh, for you uh, with the right-hand side, the same right here, but V now, uh, uh, satisfies the Helmholtz equation in D, 
Okay, so you can formulate this problem looking for U in H02. Okay, so it's a natural space for the source problem for this equation. And this H02 means that I have the Cauchy data zero because the fact that U is compactly supported uh, for, uh, say, Lipschitz, at least Lipschitz. Um, uh, boundaries means that U has Cauchy data zero on the boundary of D, okay? And then, uh, then you have this equation. So you have two equations inside D connected this way, and U has two uh, zero, uh, the, uh, zero uh, conditions, right? So it's a non-standard eigenvalue, eigenvalue problem. So instead of looking for Ks that satisfy this, how about I look for Ks that satisfy this, right? So, so uh, if uh, the, this is satisfied, the transmission eigenvalue problem has eigenvalues, uh, then probably that would be the pool where I'm going to look for non-scattering wave numbers, right? So by restricting, uh, by relaxing a little bit the condition on V, okay, making the problem not overdetermined, then I uh, come up with a necessary condition for K to be uh, a non-scattering wave number. So it makes sense to study this transmission eigenvalue problem. So if now I can write this transmission eigenvalue problem, instead of writing it for U and V, I write it for U plus V and V, okay? So I get a exactly the same type of eigenvalue problem I showed you for spherically symmetric media. Uh, and this is um, uh, two equation inside D sharing the same Cauchy data. Very simple problem. It has a perplexing uh, mathematical structure, is a non-self-adjoined eigenvalue problem. It's not elliptic because the sign is wrong. So you have two equations inside. It doesn't satisfy the ellipticity condition, uh, Egmont Nuremberg, Douglas Nuremberg ellipticity condition, although it looks so simple and a naive, so to speak, problem. Okay, two elliptic equations sharing the same Cauchy data. So uh, uh, you, 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 you analyze this uh, for um, distributional solutions to this, uh, to this two elliptic equations sharing the same Cauchy data. Otherwise, you can look at this problem as uh, uh, finding ca the kernel of the difference of uh, Dirichlet to Neumann operators, one corresponding to Q equal to one and one corresponding to Q equal to N. Okay, so another way uh, to formulate this problem, and you can see here, uh, because uh, Dirichlet to Neumann operator for each n is elliptic, for each q it's elliptic, however, the difference here, okay, is not going to be positive definite anymore up to a compact perturbation. So the problem is really interesting, and this would, it makes this problem non-self-adjoined, actually. All right, so what is known about this uh, transmission eigenvalue problems? I'm putting the main results here. Um, actually, um, there is interest on this a spectral problem on its own, uh, not connected with the uh, non-scattering configuration that I'm discussing here. It's a very interesting spectral problem. So the following it is known. The main assumption is that n minus one must have the same sign in the neighborhood of the boundary. And then you can guess that this is important from that uh, uh, formulation as difference of Dirichlet to Neumann operator that I uh, uh, just showed earlier. Okay, so under this assumption, then people have studied uh, the discreteness of the spectrum uh, simply for Lipschitz boundaries and L infinity. If it's a little bit smoother uh, near the boundary, then people have come up with completeness of generalized eigenfunctions, Weyl's law, and all of it. And uh, if uh, using uh, micro local analysis, uh, semi classical analysis, uh, uh, Voldev actually showed that all transmission eigenvalues for um, a very smooth configuration lie in a strip around the real axis, okay? So, and I said that there are complex eigenvalues known for spherically symmetric media, okay? So, but now let me go uh, to my question. 
I'm interested whether there are real transmission eigenvalues because I would like to analyze the non scattering configuration. Uh, so uh, I, I need to figure out whether the necessary condition is satisfied. Okay. The only known result is some old result uh, by uh, myself, Gintides, and Hadar. So we showed that uh, if the this contrast n minus one is one sign in the entire D, not only in, in, in a neighborhood of the boundary, then indeed there exist infinitely many real transmission eigenvalues. They accumulate to plus infinity, okay? And in fact, one can show some sort of uh, faber crown type inequality that uh, for small k, there are no real transmission eigenvalues. So this is, uh, non if we would like to look at non-scattering phenomena, um, uh, Born approximation is out of picture. So if you just simply consider a low frequency, then you don't see this interesting non-scattering phenomena, right? So, so this result tells me that the necessary condition uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, satisfiable uh, under some assumptions, right? So now I would like to analyze the question um, that I started with. Or when a transmission eigenvalue, real transmission eigenvalue now is a non-scattering uh, wave number. And here it comes the second uh, side of the problem that connects to uh, regularity of eigenfunctions and free boundary value, uh, value problems. <clears throat> Okay, so let me let me uh, recall to make this connection. Uh, so again, I'm addressing the question. Suppose I have a transmission eigenvalue. Okay, so I have a, a, a non-zero solution to this uh, set of PDEs. So U in H zero two, V in L two. Okay, that satisfies this. When is K a, a, a non-scattering wave number? Non-scattering wave number, now I have this configuration. The only difference between these two problems is that this V must exist as a solution to the Helmholtz equation in the entire space. Or, okay, uh, equivalently uh, in, in a neighborhood uh, of, uh, so in a larger domain containing D. Okay, so the question becomes now this L2 eigenfunction, uh, under what assumption this L2 eigenfunction uh, is a solution to the Helmholtz equation outside uh, in a region including uh, D, okay? So in that case, this eigenfunction has to be analytic actually because solutions to the Helmholtz equation are analytic in the region up to the boundary, right? So it's a regularity issue of the eigenfunctions up to the boundary. All right, so, so what is known under this assumption? So you probably expect, since it's a regularity um, uh, issue, you would expect that if the, uh, the domain has corners, probably uh, the V cannot be extended as a solution to the Helmholtz equation outside D. So V is already a solution to the Helmholtz equation in D by the virtue of K being a transmission eigenvalue, right? So to be a non-scattering wave number, we should be able to extend this V as a solution to the Helmholtz equation outside. And the first result in this regard uh, was proven by uh, Blast and Pivarinta and Sylvester. And roughly they show that uh, if there exists um, a singularity on the boundary where the refractive index is not one, uh, is not the same as of the uh, background, uh, then, uh, then actually V uh, cannot, cannot be extended outside, okay? as a solution to the Helmholtz equation. So the set of transmission eigenvalues is infinite. The set of non-scattering wave number is empty, right? So none of the transmission eigenvalue, eigenvalues is a, is a, uh, a, a non-scattering wave number, okay? So basically the two techniques that people, people use uh, to uh, understand this extendability of the eigen of, of V as a solution to the Helmholtz equation uh, uh, are uh, 
uh, one um, basically you, uh, arrive at the integral um, equality near the corner uh, in a neighborhood of the corner. Uh, and in order to deal with uh, that part that uh, you don't have any conditions, one uses some uh, uh, CGO solutions, uh, rapidly, rapidly decaying solutions of exponential type that are used actually for uniqueness in inverse, in inverse problems uh, in order to cancel the contribution from this part and arrive at a contradiction uh, that, uh, that because of the corner, uh, then you don't have the regularity that you want um, uh, uh, for, for V if V was uh, extendable outside, okay? Another approach is simply uh, comparing the, uh, doing the singularity analysis of uh, the transmission eigenfunctions uh, using uh, so regularity theory of, uh, of PDEs, but it's not trivial because uh, the uh, trans transmission uh, eigenvalue problem is not standard uh, uh, elliptic problem. So these are the two approaches for the corners uh, that couldn't be extended um, uh, for more regular uh, domains. So for some years, this question was a stagnation, a stagnating for uh, uh, non non um, for regular boundaries. Uh, so. Uh, the answer um, has uh, sort of some resolution of these questions had been uh, achieved only this year. Okay, so first for very simple configuration um, uh, for uh, n constant and C2 boundary, it is shown that uh, at most finitely many uh, transmission eigenvalue could be a non scattering, but possibly empty. And there is a partial result for smooth domains with high curvatures at, at parts, uh, but uh, the uh, most sort of comprehensive sort of understanding up to date uh, is given by these two papers. Um, uh, it's a result by myself and Fogelius and uh, Salo Shangolian. And um, these, two, these two works connected uh, the question of extendability to actually um, uh, uh, free, boundary, free boundary methods. So naturally it becomes actually a free boundary problem. So this is nice because uh, there is a lot of understanding of free boundaries, even for nonlinear equations. So this connection opens the, the possibility uh, to analyze, uh, analyze this uh, non-scattering non frequency, even for um, nonlinear um, uh, mediums, nonlinear scattering problems. Uh, but uh, you can see why it's, um, it's uh, a natural connection with free boundary. In fact, it is a free boundary problem because if uh, you look at uh, locally at a point on the boundary, basically you have some configuration like this, which is a classical uh, bound, a free boundary uh, formulation. So you have the Laplacian equal to some source and the source is now zero uh, com uh, compactly. So, and then uh, the boundary, the free boundary, it's a point where both uh, W and the gradients are equal to zero. So typically the free boundary requires that uh, some uh, positivity condition on W. And this is the issue uh, that um, needs to be um, analyzed for our problem because for our problem, W is solution to Elmer's equation and oscillates, right? So it doesn't have one sign. And F, the, the source here looks like this. So if you take, you need to have a real, a real source, a real uh, valued um, uh, function. So you can take the real, the real value of the equation, or you can take the real, uh, the imaginary part of the equation. So here I have, uh, I have the, taken the real part of the source problem for the scattering problem. So therefore the W here satisfies this, okay, with the source of this form, right? The source is not now a, a function, but depends on W also, okay? All right, so it's a natural connection with the free boundary. So basically you would like to analyze what is the regularity of the free boundary uh, uh, in this case, okay? And uh, 
basically uh, now known scattering uh, uh, in the in the in the framework of the free boundary uh, means uh, the following so the uh, incident field v doesn't scatter uh, if this local problem in a neighborhood of a point uh, z on the boundary uh, doesn't hold right so so you have this uh, source problem the cauchy data are equal to zero uh, on on uh, on the part of the boundary uh, intersected uh, with that is inside this small neighborhood. Okay, and um, and of course you need this uh, non-vanishing condition. Okay, so now using free boundary methods. Uh, we can understand when, uh, when, or a necessary condition uh, for these to hold, or sufficient sufficient conditions for this not to hold, right? So basically, we show that uh, that uh, incident field V uh, is scattered uh, if there exists a point on the boundary. Okay, where the refractive index is not zero and the is not one, and the scattered and the incident field uh, doesn't vanish there, okay? Such that if N and V are re real analytic, uh, but the boundary is not uh, locally here uh, uh, analytic, okay? Or N and V have this regularity, but uh, uh, the boundary here uh, doesn't have this regularity, okay? This is what you expect now from the understanding of regularity of free boundaries, right? Okay, so as you see, uh, this, uh, this result can also be interpreted as a regularity result for the eigenfunction V. Because uh, if you see here, uh, basically uh, it is in terms, in terms of the regularity of the uh, incident, field, um, incident field V. <clears throat> All right, so what is the idea of the proof? Of course, uh, the uh, standard, the state of the art of high regularity of the free boundary is the work by uh, Kinder, Lehner, and Nuremberg. Uh, so you get the free boundary regularity. If you start with the boundary locally C1, everything is local in this business, and uh, the solution you uh, C2. Okay, so, so starting with this uh, regularity of the boundary and the solution, then you get uh, this uh, statement that we had in the main theorem uh, for uh, non-scattering um, uh, or scattering uh, configuration, okay? But the question is how to, uh, in, uh, how to obtain uh, this regularity if you start with Lipschitz, for example, okay? Or less starting regularity. So in the work with, uh, with Michael Fogelius, we used actually the uh, result due to Caffarelli, although there are more um, uh, optimal results these days, we simply use this uh, result uh, basically show uh, that that tells you that uh, when you get that uh, the the solution of the free boundary um, is uh, C two, and when the boundary is C one, if you start with uh, with a Lipschitz, a locally Lipschitz uh, boundary, okay. The whole thing in this paper is that it requires it's for uh, for the Laplace equation and requires the source uh, here to have to be one side okay and um, and uh, the, uh, and also needs a solution to be c11 and this was uh, a problem for uh, our uh, non scattering configuration because the source here uh, has this form is in terms of the scattered field okay the scattered field is oscillating so you need to analyze it and uh, the solution W, it's not uh, a trivial, it's not obviously uh, in C11 because the source has a jump across the free boundary, right? So some uh, 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 more advanced regularity of the solution of the source problem is needed and actually making use of the fact that W is zero identically zero on the other side of the free boundary to prove that indeed the solution is, is C11 and having F now in C11, one can conclude that in fact, if you have this non-degeneracy condition, then you can guarantee that the solution is C11 and basically use Caffarelli's result to get uh, the starting regularity result for Kinder, Lehner and Nuremberg. 
right? So this was basically the idea of the proof uh, to give those regularity, uh, so regularity result for non-scattering um, necessary condition for non-scattering to occur. So roughly what we said that uh, for uh, analytic refractive index, if the incident field doesn't vanish at a point, uh, in the neighborhood of that point, the boundary has to be analytic. Okay, so this uh, if if uh, uh, the a non uh, scattering configuration uh, would have to happen. All right. So uh, in this paper, there are some uh, more uh, kind of refined uh, or optimal starting regularity than uh, Lipschitz. Uh, they use more sort of recent work uh, in order to achieve the uh, starting regularity of, uh, of the free boundary <clears throat> for uh, uh, Nirenberg, uh, Kinder Lechner and Nirenberg work. All right, but uh, this was pretty much uh, we, we, we were able to prove. So now the this was in the in the in the in the context of negative results somehow we basically are saying that if it's not analytic roughly then uh, the non scattering wave number for analytic refractive index uh, uh, do not do not occur so there are infinitely many eigenvalues no no uh, uh, non scattering wave numbers right now for ball for balls i just said that there are infinitely many uh, non scattering wave numbers because they are the same. Both sets coincide. Okay. So now the question becomes is it possible? Uh, can you find an analytic uh, inhomogeneity, uh, non spherically symmetric, uh, that, uh, that, is, uh, that has non scattering configuration? So this was answered in that paper by Salo Shangolian. And basically they said the following, right? So, so if um, the incident field uh, is positive on the boundary. And if you prescribe a refractive index as an analytic function in the neighborhood of the boundary, then you can extend this refractive index uh, inside D as an analytic function for which the inhomogeneity, and, and if D is given an analytic domain, then for which this inhomogeneity doesn't scatter uh, the incident field. So they give a, some, a posit, positive result, right? So they are not saying that given an, given an inhomogeneity, analytic inhomogeneity, there exists an incident field. They are saying that given an analytic region, uh, this analytic region can support a refractive index, analytic refractive index for which a incident field that is positive on the boundary doesn't scatter. Okay, so the, uh, uh, are there incident fields that are positive on the boundary? Okay, yes, they are, uh, because uh, they are actually even physical incident fields if you assume that K is not a Dirac eigenvalue, because uh, uh, those physical incident fields that I called Herglot's functions actually are dense uh, in the space of uh, distributional solutions of the Helmholtz equation inside D. So if you have that K is not a Dirac eigenfunction, that eigenvalue, then you can have uh, solutions uh, of Helmholtz equation in D that are positive on the boundary, and then you can approximate them uh, with uh, physical incident fields, okay? So there is a conditional, so to speak, positive result conditional to K uh, being not a Dirac eigenvalue. And here comes a very interesting spectral question. Um, uh, are there wave numbers K that are both Dirac eigenvalues and transmission eigenvalues, right? Because to have a positive um, uh, non-scattering uh, uh, answer, uh, you must have K uh, transmission eigenvalue. So this result requires K not to be a Dirac eigenvalue. So this is interesting uh, to study, okay? So are there such Ks that are transmission eigenvalues, but not a Dirac eigenvalue? So another open spectral uh, question. Okay, so the last five minutes, I would like to um, explain all these results uh, in a more physical configuration, right? So if you saw, uh, uh, when, uh, when I, uh, you saw in my discussion that, uh, that all this um, uh, existence of non-scattering configuration um, it uh, ma made use of uh, simply the fact that uh, uh, V doesn't exist as a solution to the Helmholtz equation 
uh, in a region surrounding the inhomogeneity D. Okay, so somehow didn't have to, to do uh, uh, anything with uh, the fact that V is a physical, uh, physical incident field, right? So we basically showed that the scattering configuration doesn't hold and all we needed uh, to look at was that V cannot be extended as a solution to the Helmholtz equation in a vicinity of, uh, of the inhomogeneity. But in scattering theory, for the injectivity of the so-called scattering operator, uh, what is important is that those um, uh, Vs are uh, um, some physical waves, right? In particular, superposition of plane waves of this type. So these are important, right? The same as uh, what we had for the spherically symmetric case. All right, so, so um, in that case, all right, um, the negative results, of course, holds because negative results holds for uh, um, a larger class of uh, uh, incident fields and definitely holds for this uh, uh, physical, uh, physical uh, fields. So basically, under negative results for non-scattering uh, assumptions for negative results on non-scattering, we can show that the scattering operator uh, it's uh, it's always injective. Okay, so you don't have this configuration uh, that you send a Heglot's function that doesn't produce any scattered field back, right? So this uh, this if this hold would mean that the scattering operator uh, is uh, uh, um, non-injective. Okay, the scattering operator in my definition maps the uh, um, the density of superposition of the plane waves that I had. Okay, so Herglot functions here uh, to the uh, the scattered field far away um, from uh, like far field pattern, the asymptotic uh, the asymptotic part of the scattered field, right? So I have the injectivity of the far field operator uh, under the assumptions of uh, um, uh, uh, non-existence of non-scattering uh, configurations. Okay, and this is good. Uh, when we do imaging with waves. So now um, uh, the uh, non-injectivity uh, is answered uh, by, uh, by this uh, uh, example that I, 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 I discussed earlier um, that uh, showed that for analytic boundaries, you may have in fact uh, non-scattering in homogeneities, okay? Because uh, uh, under that uh, condition that K is not a directly eigenvalue. In fact, you can find Herglot's functions, the superposition of plane waves um, that uh, do this trick, right? For which uh, you can construct a non, uh, an analytic uh, non-scattering in homogeneity. So uh, whereas uh, uh, we gave a companion results to this one, because this is conditional to K being uh, not a directly eigenvalue. Uh, we gave a companion in the sense that uh, that uh, you, the injectivity injectivity could fail uh, for at most finitely many uh, wave wave numbers, right? So so basically, this uh, uh, re uh, regularity results using free boundary that explain on scattering can be now. Um, interpreted in the context of scattering theory where uh, the V part that appeared in all this discussion has a physical uh, form, in particular Herglot's wave function. So this is pretty much uh, what I wanted to discuss, but I like to make a, a couple of historical um, remarks and uh, some interesting questions with some uh, big open problems um, uh, in, in mathematics. Um, so when I was looking at Kinderlehner and Nuremberg, I a paper I saw that was dedicated to Hans Levy, and um, uh, actually, uh, interestingly enough, um, it was Hans Levy that in 1959 uh, formulated um, a problem that uh, looks like transmission uh, eigenvalue problem. So basically he said that uh, in R2, if you have a region that uh, part of the boundary is a real axis, okay, and, and it's an analytic function, 
uh, then uh, does this uh, problem has uh, a non-trivial solution, right? So the Cauchy data coincide on this straight part of the boundary. And here you have the Laplacian, and here you have the equation with uh, uh, this coefficient and x, y. So it's sort of the very first sort of formulation that you found in the literature question that kind of resembles that uh, um, a transmission eigenvalue problem. So two elliptic PDEs sharing the same Cauchy data. And actually using Kosikova-Levskaya, Levy said, uh, uh, um, uh, concluded that actually this doesn't hold, right? For, uh, okay. Whereas for now, more general formulation of the interior transmission, transmission eigenvalue problem. So we actually showed that uh, it could hold, right? That uh, uh, even for balls, uh, for analytic boundaries and N of R analytic. Uh, so you could have uh, infinitely many uh, uh, eigenvalues in that case. But this is different because there is no parameter here, eigenvalue parameter. So now another connection uh, to some famous uh, questions. It's not exactly a direct question, but the, the, the mathematical flavor uh, is sort of similar. Uh, so the non-scattering uh, configuration we were trying to understand, it resembles the, so the famous Schiffer's uh, conjecture, Schiff, uh, domains with Schiffer's property, or equivalently in the, in the uh, context of inter integral geometry uh, is the Pompeo's property, right? Pompeo's conjecture. So you can see here, this is non-scattering configuration. So you have an equation like this with the source, but the source here uh, uh, is, has a jump uh, across the boundary of D, uh, but has a more complicated form, right? Because, uh, so this is a supportly compacted in D, and then the Cauchy data of U uh, are, are zero, so U would be like a, a compactly supported distributional solution of this uh, source problem. The same, the Schiffer's property, uh, Schiffer's conjecture uh, is formulated in a kind of a similar looking um, set of equations. So uh, D has Schiffer's property. Uh, if, uh, if this problem has no solution for any uh, parameter lambda here. Okay, so uh, the Schiffer's conjecture says that the only, the only domain that uh, fails to have the Schiffer's property uh, is a ball, right? Whereas actually, for our non-scattering configuration, we show that in fact the balls uh, uh, satisfy the non-scattering configuration. But thanks to the the example of Salo and Shangolian, there are analytic domains and analytic refractive index n for which uh, this non-scattering configuration uh, occurs. Right. So I wanted to show this uh, kind of connection more in the flavor of mathematics that one could use uh, to understand those questions. So that's the end of, uh, of my talk. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Let's unmute ourselves and thank uh, Professor Sakoni for her wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, so I'll open the floor for questions. Are there any questions for uh, the speaker? So uh, I have a question. This is Venki. Yes. So for this uh, Schiffer's property, uh, problem right so are there domains for which this this is known uh uh i i think i think there are i think uh i think uh i uh, of course for bowls right uh and and so i i i'm i i should say that i'm not familiar with uh the state of the art, uh, I mean, what are the most up-to-date results on Schiffer's conjecture, right? But, uh, but my understanding is, is that uh, people have given some, some um, an, uh, equivalent conditions for which uh, uh, Schiffer's property, uh, Schiffer's property uh, uh, doesn't hold, uh, but not really characterizing 
characterizing the, uh, the, the regions, right? Kind of geometrically saying that these type of domains uh, satisfy or do not satisfy Schiffer's conjecture, right? So the progress to my understanding is uh, coming up, making sort of one step at a time, coming up to kind of uh, more uh, refined uh, uh, conditions uh, for which the Schiffer's property uh, fails, right? So. So I know I that a bowl, uh, a bowl. Uh, uh, of course, it's known that uh, for a bowl, it's um, it's not. Um, so uh, the Schiffer's property uh, fails. I see. But, uh, so because the conjecture that that stated is a negative result, right? So it says right, fails right. to have. I see. Exactly. Right. So. But there could also be a positive result, right? So, uh, but uh, the. Uh, Yes, so and actually, uh, actually, this is where we, we, we were inspired. Uh, yes, that's true. So, for example, Lipschitz boundaries. Uh, actually, actually, the, our approach follows the work by Williams, and Schiffer's property is equivalent to uh, Pompeo's property. So basically, he showed that if the boundary is uh, Lipschitz, uh, then uh, then the the Schiffer's property uh, is, is is satisfied, right? So yeah, I see. Thank you. So, but but what I said, it's interesting. It's uh, yes. So, if it's not not regular enough, then yes. But it's interesting to know if it's interesting to know whether anal analytic boundaries. So, what I said is not known in the sense. What you'd like to to understand if analytic boundaries uh, uh, are there analytic uh, uh, domains uh, for which Schiffer's property fails, right? And this is not known to my knowledge. Yes. Okay, right. thank so, you. Yeah. Are there other questions from the audience? Let us take the opportunity to thank uh, Professor Sarkoni for the wonderful talk again. And... Thank, you. Uh, thank you, Professor Kakoni. Thank you. Great to see you. Thank you. Nice to meet everyone. Yeah, good to see you as well. Bye -bye.